Okay. We are live. David Van Daff, welcome to the Future of Fitness. Thank you, Eric. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it is an absolute pleasure. We are sitting here on the morning of, uh, I guess, day two of the trade show at IDEA in uh, Los Angeles. And I guess, first question for you, well, let me introduce you. You are the Director of Global Industry Development. Uh, that is one hell of a title, man, <laughs> uh, for NASM. And uh, you have a wealth of experience. I mean, 27 years. We're going to cover a lot of things about the evolution of health clubs, what's changed, what hasn't, um, the innovation that's taken place, what you guys are up to, obviously, at NASM. Uh, but I guess my first question for you is, you know, we're on day two after the trade show. You had a full day yesterday, busy. Uh, as all people know, when you do conferences like this, it's nonstop, right? Um, it's like adrenaline coffee conversations meetings, maybe a meal if you're lucky. Um, what, what are your first uh, impressions after day one of, of this conference? First impression to start with is I go back far enough, you know, obviously pre-COVID, and, and have, this has probably been my 23rd, 24th IDEA conference. Oh, wow. So okay. It's wonderful to see the droves of people coming back into the conference world. We had a bit of this experience uh, last year, even the year before, as people started coming back, whether it was URSA, IDEA, um, Athletic Business Conference, variety of the other ones that are out there, it just keeps on growing. Much like the health club industry coming after COVID, where we really learned the fact that people did build out their home gyms, people did sign up for subscriptions and start doing things independently as their gyms were closed. But as soon as those gyms open, they found their way back. Same thing within the fitness industry. So it's been wonderful to see longtime business operators, innovators coming back to this conference. It's great seeing new faces. Uh, big message is, is that these aren't going away, that people do want to interact with their peers. They do want to come and see what is new and, and, and what, what is in a booth and what new technology exists, et cetera, et cetera. So that's been exciting. Um, every year, somewhat kind of post-COVID within our industry, we get more and more of those folks coming back. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Is, is there anything, uh, when we talk about innovation and some of the brands, and I'm just kind of looking around, is there anything that's, that stood out to you, anything that you found pretty interesting and new? <sighs> that's a great question. I wouldn't say new and innovative, um, looking as we're sitting here, looking at the TRX booth that we're, we're so familiar with yeah, seeing yeah. that same type of equipment, but seeing new faces and seeing new programming associated with it. So I'll say more and more spins on existing products, existing businesses, how they're promoting themselves, what they are providing. So not necessarily new products, but almost like new marketing, uh, new pushes um, uh, to represent the modern everyday fitness consumer, which is different than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going we're gonna to circle back that because that's a really meaty point. Mm -hmm. um, Let's let's guide through this. I mean, 27 years you've been in the, in the industry now. You've you've been uh, when uh, NASM. You were for a period of time. You stepped away, did some other things, and now you're back. But I guess as as best you can, summarizing 27 years, which is a hard thing to do. But give us a little bit of your background. How'd you get to be, to this point? Absolutely. Was working in sport throughout college. Was a graduate assistant at University of Tennessee football. Coming out in 1996, while I was interviewing to continue in sports, Valley Total Fitness was booming, and booming in Chicago. I had come back, I was interviewing for a variety of different positions. Valley was very aggressive in hiring people from sports, some fitness involvement, um, and, and doing so in such a way where they were creating career paths in fitness that didn't exist previously. In 1996, I was hired, eventually took over the Chicago market for Bally, which was roughly 30 to 35 clubs, um, found a passion for fitness and the business of fitness that I didn't know existed. The thought process was I would do that for a year while I was interviewing within sport, finding the pathway that I wanted to pursue. Every month that I was in fitness, I enjoyed it more and more. Awesome. Was in a period of time within this industry to where it was growing exponentially. So I was at a very young age able to take on more and more responsibility. So I went from running a club 
to running the Chicago market to coming over to corporate to help run all of fitness operations, personal training, group exercise, education, anything associated with fitness fell into my realm all within a quick period of time. Snap of the finger, 14 years later, highs and lows of Valley, found my way then eventually to NASM. I was a big customer client of NASM over the course of time that I was running things for Valley in particular personal training and the volume of personal trainers that were working in our facilities. So it was a natural fit for me to come over to NASM. Did that for five years, had an opportunity to be a part of a startup with other folks from the fitness industry and more particularly NASM. Did that for five years and then as NASM continued to grow exponentially and just grow by leaps and bounds and made other acquisitions, one in particular Club Connect from, that was started by the Idea Group, uh, it opened up an opportunity that was just way too good to be true, and I found myself back at NASM a little over three years ago then running all of global industry development. Yeah, it's quite a journey, David. Uh, and when we say that the director of global industry development, I mean, I know we'll get into Club Connect, and maybe you can you know give everyone who's not familiar with what that is, sure. uh, but it's something like 10,000 health clubs, gyms on that. Yes. Yeah. So what, what is your role? What is that, that big glob of, of words uh, as a title? What does that mean? To start with, I oversee the health club division. We, could, we still call it a health club division. Okay. And sometimes that just feels like an outdated term, but it's probably the most appropriate term. Yeah. When you think about the facilities that are represented here in an idea, some of them consider themselves health clubs. Some of them are gyms. Mm -hmm. Some of them are studios. Some are boutiques. Some are performance uh, uh, facilities, et cetera, et cetera. But we group them all in health club. I oversee the health club division. So providing solutions to health clubs is our primary objective. That may be in the form of helping gyms advertise open positions on nasmjobs.com. It may come in the form of, hey, that we need to get people certified within this location. So providing discounts and pathways for those employees or aspiring employees to become educated and certified. It may be Club Connect, which is, and we can talk about this, but, but it is a, uh, a hub for continuing education personal trainers, group exercise instructors that need to maintain continuing education. We've got over 400 courses that they can participate in in order to maintain that certification. We also have courses for the front desk person that needs to understand customer service starting in a position. We also have CPR for everybody within the facility that needs it. Uh, we also have courses tied into particular equipment. As we brought up TRX before, we've got courses that show programming on TRX. We have courses that go through uh, MyZone, for example, in terms hmm. of how to utilize that in your programming. So anything that you can think of to educate, develop, grow, continue to maintain a certification falls in under Club Connect. So it falls into this, um, um, this overall deliverable of solutions that we provide the health club industry. So that's, that's the primary within my global industry developments. It extends beyond U.S. borders. So I oversee our international division too. We're in 28 countries right now that we wow. are actively selling product and educating staff. Uh, so I oversee that division, and then in particular, when we, we break out the solutions, then Club Connect is a business unto itself. So not only with Club Connect do we have the continuing education, but we've got a variety of different resources and, um, and different things that a club can utilize in terms of maintaining a staff, helping develop a staff, and retaining a staff ultimately. Got it. Got it. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, I, I think a good segue is here, you, you mentioned during that um, last piece that the term health club seems to be a bit outdated, yeah. right? Uh, I think that's a, a really nice conversation starter because, I mean, over 27 years, you've seen a lot. I mean, Valley's obviously is a, you know, legendary brand. Um, I'm not exactly sure what happened to Valley's. We don't have to get into that now, but <laughs> <laughs> I know it was when I was uh, younger, it was, it was, it was a really big deal. Um, what, okay. Why do you feel that the term health club is outdated or why do you think the industry feels that way. I think because of its origins, 1980, 1990, the health club industry, you brought up Bally. Go back to 1996. Bally Total Fitness is in 26 major cities. Most of these cities, if you want to 
begin working out in a facility, it's either Bally or it's 24-hour fitness. If you're on the West Coast, it's 24. If you're Midwest to East, it is Bally. When you made that commitment to exercise, you were typically walking into one of the two clubs. At the time, it was a health club. A lot of the early Bally Total Fitness clubs were set up on leg warmers and fancy group exercise, and there were taverns that were built into the health club environment to where it was a social setting. It was all kinds of crazy lights. It was part disco, part group exercise, part what now would be considered outdated equipment. Early days of fitness, moving more and having fun doing it. So I think that health club term for a lot of us that have been in the industry for a long period of time goes back to that visual, not the modern day box, we'll call it, that typically people go into. Um, so I, I, I think just because of its age is why it gets grouped into that. Is it still associated with health? Probably now more than ever. Right. Um, but, but the whole aspect of health club, it's, it's just an older term. It's the, the same way of group exercise. Like we don't call it jazzercise anymore, or yeah. dance or, or some of the other things. Yeah, I was thinking aer yeah. aerobics. Yeah, aerobics. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Bit of an, is it still relevant? Does it still apply? Without question. It's just an older term. Yeah, got it. Well, uh, so what, let's start with this. What has changed, you know, over the last like two to three decades within, well, st I still call them health clubs. Yep. Uh, maybe I'm outdated. That's possible. <laughs> uh, but what do you, uh, what, what has changed? Then we'll get into what hasn't. So let's go back on that ballet model we talked about in 96. You make a commitment to exercise. You walk into a ballet club you're more than likely not shopping the club and then going to two or three other clubs because it's more than likely your only option. You're going in, you're buying a membership. Back in this era, typically you're buying a three-year commitment. So it's not a month-to-month, -month, that didn't exist. You are signing up in a three-year commitment and it was a pretty steep financial commitment at that point, almost like buying a car. You're saying, hey, next 36 months, I'm gonna be paying you 50 to 80 to $100 a month, and I'm going to stay with this exercise program. And regardless if I go or not, I owe you that money consistently. In going into that environment, then, you typically would go through an orientation. You would be taught a workout program because, Eric, the, the Internet doesn't exist back then. You may buy a book on exercise, but in a lot of cases, the folks that were buying memberships there are going, I've never been a health club member. I've never had a commitment to exercise. I've never been on a routine. I've watched Jack LaLanne on television a bit. I know what athletes are doing to a certain degree, but teach me what I need to do. Far different than what it is today in the Instagram influencer world, in the give me a workout off of my phone and six billion hits come up with a variety of different exercise routines. We lacked that information and knowledge. So typically you're coming in, going through an orientation with your three-year commitment. Personal training does not exist. Um, affiliate type supplemental services do not exist within a health club. There's no nutrition. There's no small group personal training. You've got a group exercise schedule, which is going to give you slide and step. And maybe in a couple of years, you're going to get some spinning classes, some, uh, uh, uh cycle type classes that are going to become made available. Personal training back then was viewed as a service that was for, um, people that had, high amounts of exponential income. Oh, it's a, oh no, that's for celebrities, for the ultra rich, for, um, these are things that could not exist within an everyday health club because they just couldn't be profitable. Maybe 1% of the population would have the interest and ability to employ a personal trainer. So you think back to that era that existed 27 years ago in 1996, and then the evolution from 96 to 2000 and what that looked like. And that's where we started to see these types of services being employed. More and more people are buying health club memberships, but yet three months, six months, nine months, three years later, they're right where they started. They're not getting to the results and goals that they were after. And so as an industry, we took a step back and said, okay, what do we need to do about this? How come our members are not getting those results? And if they're not getting those results, they're no longer providing referrals. Nobody's showing up to work and going, hey, you look great. Like, what are you doing that leads to the pipeline of leads and people coming and going, I want to look like that. I want to feel like that. 
So that's where we started to evolve as an industry going, what can we do to help stimulate those results? Personal training, small group personal training. We talked about nutrition in the early days, 96 to 2000. It was a, hold on, we know there's supplements out there, but that's outside of our scope. If we start providing recommendations, we're not registered dietitians. You know, th this could put uh, uh, us into um, some form of liability. We can't. We're not registered dietitians. We can't give meal and menu planning, but we figured that out as an industry. How do we provide nutrition support to help stimulate these results, which is going to fuel our entire industry? With that, then, now you fast forward to the 2020s, and we've got recovery rooms. We took racquetball courts and we said, okay, 3% of our, our membership use racquetball. Make that into a personal training studio. Um, now we've got, we've taken these lines and lines and lines of selectorized equipment and go, let's go with two lines. Let's open up the floor and put in suspension trainers. Let's put in kettlebells. Let's expand out the free weight room. So it has always been about one thing, which is helping members get results. And I think as an industry, the reason that we've evolved is we've seen our members. We see the members that are coming in day after day after day, and it's a, they aren't getting the results, and if they're not, they're eventually going to phase out, and, um, and they're not going to provide those referrals, and we're not going to grow, and they're going to find other solutions because the quest towards getting those results is not going to go away, but they're going to lose confidence in themselves if we're not providing the solutions for them to get to those results. Yeah, yeah, well said. There, there's a lot I want to dive into on that. I mean, I guess the, you know, ultimately consumer demands drive the change, right? You know, how, how consumers shift and what they need and what they want, you know, something as I look at that time span, because that's basically, you know, I'm 46 years old. So I kind of seen that evolution too. I remember when my dad joined 24 hour fat and fitness and it was a three year commitment and it was like lifetime for like 20 bucks a month, right? If he's bought this huge package and then, uh, anyway, um, one of the things I've noticed, and maybe this got accelerated over the pandemic, and feel free to agree, disagree, but you know that the gym and health club used to be the center of, of one's fitness, mm -hmm. right? It was like, okay, everything's there, the knowledge, the equipment. Um, and then, you know, like I said, accelerated, but started a long time ago, but it accelerated over the pandemic. But it's like, there's so much information out there. There's so many apps, there's so many resources, there's podcasts, there's YouTube, there's, you know, people can just ask their, you know, ask Siri for whatever. Or now it's chat GPT. You can get a workout plan within a, you know, 30 seconds of your specific needs and what you want. So like, what do you, I mean, that, that's my kind of thought is like technology is kind of driving people from, uh, I always use the, the hub and smoke models. Like the, the, the gym and the health club used to be the hub, mm -hmm. right. Of everything. And now the consumer's the hub of everything and, and the health clubs a spoke, right? But they have all these different ways that they can get fit, whether it be, you know, outdoors or, you know, recovery or an application or home fitness, right? It's just part of that. So, I mean, do you, do, would you agree with that or do you have a different take on that? Or why, why do you think the consumer demands are driving all this change within the health clubs? It's a great question. Let me start by saying this. Back when I started in the industry, if somebody came in to tour a club and buy a membership, more than likely, it's the first time they've ever bought a membership to a health club. So this is a new journey. And when they were coming in, they had the confidence that, hey, I made the commitment. I finally stopped into the health club. I've, you know, I'm now going to go forth and get the results I'm looking for. These days, when somebody walks into a health club, more than likely, they have belonged to multiple health clubs in the past. Maybe it was a 24-hour fitness back in the day, and that didn't seem to work. Then they, then they bought a membership to a studio because a friend of theirs started going to classes, and they were looking good. But, you know, that didn't work out very well. Maybe they made a commitment to their home gym then, ultimately, and said, I'm going to buy a Peloton, and I'm going to go through this programming. And, and then that evolved into something else. Once again, that quest towards results. But I think what's happened is the consumer has lost confidence, in many cases, in themselves. So it's a, they're not coming into the health club anymore going, this is it. This is the oasis. I have found it. Now I'm on my way to getting those results. They come in with a bit of trepidation, I believe, because they have that past experience of this not working, this not working, this not working. So when you talk about that hub, it used to be the, that's my solution. Now I believe that everyday consumer is looking at it going, 
okay, I know I need to go and I know I, I need I need this membership because I can't do it in my home gym. I don't have the accountability of myself in order to be able to do it. But I'll go three days a week to the gym. I'm going to start eating better. I'm going to track my steps off of my tracker. I'm going to do this, that, this, that. It is a combination of things that I believe that the everyday consumer is looking at it going, I want to lose those 30 pounds and I want more energy and I want my arms to look better. It's going to take a broad spectrum of commitment and services in order to be able to get there. Yeah, and you, uh, you, you pointed it. There is a trepidation, you know, for a lot of consumers. I mean, I, I think at this point, if you're, I don't know, I'm just making this up based on my viewpoints. But if you're like in your late 30s or early 40s, you probably, if you haven't got the results you wanted, you probably tried at least three things to get there. And whether that problem be, you know, we can blame it on motivation of the individual, which some cases may be true, maybe not. Um, some generally unfair, I think, for a lot of it, because, you know, uh, just the way we presented health and fitness in the past is, you know, much more of a chore than anything. Um, but what do you think has been driving that trepidation for people to get in? I mean, is it, and, and it's so individual, I know it's hard to put a blanket on that, sure. but what, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Going back on that lack of confidence, hmm. I see a lack of confidence in a lot of folks that are pursuing their goals because they do have that experience in trying a variety of things. And I think very early on it was a, okay, it wasn't working for me from a fitness perspective, but this new diet looks like it's going to get me to where I need to be. And if you look at the history of time that you and I have been in this industry for a long period of time, you think from a nutrition perspective, the variety of things that have come and gone, that come into um, um, a, a level of popularity that people get on board and then that gets replaced by something else and that gets replaced by something else. So I think... Um, it is a lot of what we're talking about is stimulated by this lack of confidence. Um, the pursuit of the goals is still significant. The lack of confidence in themselves, the lack of confidence in some of the solutions that are presented to them uh, is what has shaped a lot of this. You're talking about the health club industry going back to where it was a, you had the big boxes of Bally and 24 hour fitness back in the day and that one solution. Now we've got so many different options and opportunities, whether it's a boutique or a studio, it's a high value, low price, it's a planet at any time. They're now in every single neighborhood. Most people on the planet don't need to drive more than a couple of miles to get to a health club environment. And I think a lot of that has been shaped on folks looking at it from the perspective of, how come I'm no longer consistent at my health club? What's going on in my world? How come I'm not waking up at six o'clock anymore with the motivation and the energy to get to the gym? What is it? And we're looking for answers. And I think in a lot of cases, the answer for the everyday consumer is it's no longer convenient. I don't have the time. Oh, it's too far. Oh, that was closer to my work environment where I'm not going there every single day. And so now it is a, what is going to hold me accountable? So in a lot of cases, I may have the ability, the expendable income to join a luxury brand environment. But I know in my head, seven miles away, I'll go the first month and then it's going to wear on me and wear on me. And I'm only going to use the treadmills there anyway. And maybe I'll get, I'll, uh, I'll hop in the pool once, but that's not going to be consistent. What is going to hold me accountable is I've got to drive past that high value, low price box sitting right there. It's conveniently priced. It's open 24 hours. There's no excuse. That's going to hold me accountable. So I think some of that, going back on the lack of confidence, the desire for accountability is shaping a lot of consumer decisions. Yeah, interesting. And one of the things that you touched on uh, was the social setting of like the 90s, right? Like the, the disco lights, I think, as you put it. I love, I love that. It just kind of brings me back in my memories. How are we doing with the social, like the community part of it? Like, you know, when I, when I go to my, my gym and I love to shout out to, uh, the whitefish wave and, and, uh, I love that place. I love going there. Um, I don't go enough, but whenever I go there, I, I get to interact. I see people I know inevitably, right. Small town and get to socialize. And I, and only do I get a good workout because, you know, I'm, I'm kind of just getting out of the home setting, right. Getting into the gym. Um, but I feel a sense of community there and I don't know if that's just where I live or, you know, if that's a sampling size of a lot of health clubs across, but how do you think we're doing on, in the health club perspective, how are we doing on the community and social setting piece of it? Because that seems to be more important than ever now that people work from home, they seem, you know, connected, but disconnected. Like, what's your, what's your take on that, that piece? I, I think we're doing everything that we can. 
Okay. Right, what what I see in clubs when I go in and visit is I see the television screens and I see member parties and I see running groups and I see these opportunities to bring people together. We used to appreciate and respect that element of community, but it was about a Oh, group exercise classes. There are 30 or 40 people. They come every Tuesday and Thursday night, and they do this particular class. And sometimes, you know, we see them walk out. And it looks like they go and get cocktails afterwards and different things along those lines. And then the bigger groups, and I think a lot of the luxury brands started going forth and saying, hey, we're going to create these, um, these member outings. Early days of Lifetime, and I thought it was just ingenious that they would go forth and have babysitting, for example, where it would be a, hey, bring your kids to the club. We're going to work them out. We're going to get them super tired. You can go on date night and come back. And then that somewhat evolved into they would have a member party on top with the pool. And I think in the early stages of them doing this, this was perceived as a, well, you know, it's a luxury brand. They're charging a lot of money. They can do those types of things. But I think that's trickled down to where now I see it so much where there is that attempt at community. What I was going to bring up as well is that there are pockets of groups. So if you go into a health club, and I'm, I'm, an, I'm an early morning exerciser, every gym I've ever been a part of, I see the same people. In a lot of cases, I will see them later in the community. I feel like I know them. I, I recognize that person. How do I know them? Is it college? Is it do I work with them? And it's like, no, I just see them in the gym every single morning. And I think what's really special about the health club environment, if you are a 6 a.m. workout person, you may not talk to everybody in the gym, but you're a part of this community. You're a part of this culture where if you stop showing up, people are going to look around and go, hey, what happened to that guy that was always over in that area or did that particular class? And I think that's kind of interesting, too, to where it's, it's a very unique to the health club industry. I don't know your name. I don't know your background. But I feel like I know you and you're a part of this overall commitment because you know what? We get up at five in the morning, we drink a little coffee, we hop in the car and we go to the gym and we work our tails off for 45 minutes and then we go about our everyday daily life. Yeah, it's such a, you know what I've always thought about the gym is that no matter what, it's, it's, a, it's a place of self-improvement. Yes. Right. And that, that's just a very positive vibe, no matter yes. what. And it could be anybody. It could be somebody who's, you know, been in the industry forever, who's, you know, really high training age, or it could be someone who's just, you know, learning. Like I, I help people all the time on the platforms. Like, you know, they didn't maybe don't, don't know how to put something, you know, reset the safety bar or something like that. I'm like, I love it. You know, I'll spot anyone. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's just a really fun place to be. You know, on the flip side, David, we've talked about what's, what's changed. What has not changed? What do you think has like been the core uh, tenants of health clubs or large gyms that that's been the same. Let's start with community. So, yeah. so what, what we have learned is that the health club is a very special place. Five years ago, people did not realize it was as special as it was. And it really took COVID for, for us to highlight that and teach us that because we did build out our home gyms. And we knew before that yeah, everybody bought a treadmill 10, 15 years ago and then it became a laundry hanger and this and that. But we... But, but, a lot of folks out there really felt like COVID changed everything and, and Pelotons and all of these different things. And now all this variety of equipment that we could build out in our basement. And that is going to be the key. We miss seeing people. Whether we knew them or not, we miss that element. So that community, whether it was from 1984 and going into uh, Valley Total Fitness with the disco lights and the dancing and all of those things, there was community there. There's community now as we're going back in and going, you know what? I know I could hop on the bike in my basement at six in the morning and I don't have to get in my car and I don't need to warm it up and I don't need to do all of those things, but I want to go and I want to see other people and I want to feel that energy and excitement. So I don't think that has changed, nor do I think it will change. I think we've learned so much in the last five years and it's given us so much confidence in building these health clubs, supporting these health clubs, growing these health clubs, uh, in communities that I don't see that changing at all. Results are key. It all goes back to results. I used to say very early on, nobody is buying a health club membership to show off their friends and go, I got a membership over here. It's not a country club. It is a commitment. It is a, I either want to maintain the way I look and feel, or I need to improve the way I look and feel. And so it is about results. And if people are not getting results, it gets much more difficult in order to retain them as a client. And all of the benefits that come with a client, early days of Bally, Eric, people used to come in and say, I'm your favorite type of member. 
I pay my dues every single month. I never go to the club, so I don't overpopulate it. And our standard answer was, was you're actually our worst type of member. Like, we grow as a business when you go to our club, have a positive experience, and tell the world about how you're looking and feeling the way that you do. That hasn't changed at all. Unfortunately, obesity rates, they've changed. They've actually gotten worse in the time that I've been within the industry, which really makes you go back and think reflectively on what are we doing wrong? How, how are we getting overall worse as a country? But actually, when you look at global statistics, they're not getting any better. I've got now in my area of Chicago, I've got, I could walk to five different health clubs. I could hop in and be within a five minute drive of probably 30 health club environments. I've got everything in my fingertips in terms of how to look better, how to feel better, et cetera, et cetera. But yet, overall, we're not getting any better. We've provided all these solutions that maybe 30 years ago we would have looked at and go, boy, when we get to that level, if we get to that level, the world is going to change. It hasn't. So we continue to do some things wrong, I would say, overall, not necessarily as an industry, but overall, mankind, we're not doing the type of things to be able to improve our health effectively globally. And that's concerning. So, so that, to me, hasn't changed. Results, simplicity. It's a, we talk about technology. We talk about, oh, what new equipment is out there and different things to that degree. You know, it's the expression, what old is, what, what's old is new. And, and we've seen these things that maybe were popular in the 70s come back. And it's fundamental movements. It's raising the heart rate. It's full body exercise. It's all of these things. That doesn't change. Our body doesn't evolve to a point where it's like, that no longer works. You know, get rid of the medicine ball. Get rid of the kettlebells. Get rid of free weights. That doesn't work anymore. It all works. And so the simplicity in terms of exercise programming, in terms of equipment, in terms of what it takes in order to be able to get to those results and maintain those results, that hasn't changed at all. Ultimately, our job is to help people get the results that they desire. Very often, those results are life-changing. You know, we do here in our industry, and it's something that does give us fulfillment, is that people come in, and in a lot of cases, people are coming in to join a health club because the doctor visit led to the doctor saying, okay, I looked past this a few years ago. Here's your blood pressure. Here's your cholesterol. Here's your weight. Here's what I'm seeing. You need to exercise. And it does get to that point where it's a, I've always wanted to look better and feel better. Now my doctor is saying, hey, my lifespan could be affected if I'm not getting activity. And when we're able to put people in environments to where they can become successful, and it may be a, they joined a group exercise class that really worked. They found a personal trainer that, that finally gave them that motivation that they were looking for. They started going to the community events, the party that they had on Thursday night, and the running club, and all of this combined, it changes their life. It changes the people that are around them, their kids, their spouses, and all of those things. And that hasn't changed. From a fulfillment perspective within our industry, it makes us love our industry, that we can make that positive impact. So results-driven, simplicity, um, equipment, and, and uh, there's some evolution there, but it all comes back to fundamental exercise and movement and strength training and those types of principles. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up strength training too, because that's something I've noticed and I've talked to a lot of people in the industry, but there seems to be a really uh, exciting uptrend in strength training, yes. and especially uh, in the, the, the female population, right? Um, so what, it, what are your insights on that? Like, uh, you, obviously you're not in your head, so you see that happening as well. Um, but I mean, well, why do you think that's happening? Do you think it's just a cycle that we're going through or is there something driving it? It's phenomenal. It, it really leads into what has changed dramatically in the 27 years I've been in the industry. When I started in the industry in Bali, we were building new clubs everywhere. Company was growing exponentially. We were buying, we bought Crunch, Gorilla Sports, all these brands and just growing and growing and, and financially um, things thriving in such an environment. But when we were building those clubs and we were doing layouts in these spectacular facilities, treadmills, group exercise, hide the freeway room. The freeway room would be this little tiny area where it was just folks that were working on physique and bodybuilding. Put them back over there. We used to, Eric, we used to put 
bars around the free weight area and make it look almost like it was a cage that you would have to go in. Because the thought process was, we're going to scare everybody away. This little population of males that use our clubs, we're going to scare them away. There was also a lot of focus and attention towards, hey, dumbbells, nothing over 85. Because if we go over 85 and we get to 100, then we're going to attract that person in. There's going to be throwing those around. It's going to scare everybody away. That has completely turned upside down. When I go into freeway rooms, it's one of the most substantial changes that I've seen in the health club industry is it's 50-50. It really is. In some cases, especially early mornings when I'm in a club, some cases it's 60-40 female, 70-30 female. And it's not just let me pick up some dumbbells and do arm, uh, arm curls. It is we're seeing squatting and Olympic lifts and all of this. And you know, you look, what has changed? Well, you know, the cult, or the um, the CrossFit era that came in and what that was attracting, and, and that seemed to bring in a lot of people. And I think there were a lot of people that became aspirational. We talk about referrals and what results mean and everything. And all of a sudden, there were folks, in a lot of cases, there were females that were athletes previously. They were comfortable lifting free weights that all of a sudden, boy, oh boy, look at their arms, look at their body. They've done amazing things in terms of looking like a true athlete, not looking like they lost 30 pounds and, and hard time getting energy. It's strong, empowered females. And that became aspirational to so many people. And it was a, what are you doing? How do you look like that? With technology, all of a sudden, somebody starts talking about doing a squat or, or um, uh, doing some type of Olympic lift. And now somebody can look up on their phone and look at this Instagram influencer, look at this person doing it. And they look and they go, wait a second, I could do that too. And you know what? That looks pretty cool to be able to pull off in a, in a health club environment. Drastic change. I think it's absolutely wonderful. It's changed our layouts in health clubs. It's changed our equipment selection. I just get such a kick because I spent so many years designing our health clubs in terms of you know, CAD drawings and we're going to put all this up front and now what used to be up front to draw people in is pushed to the back and people want to see free weights and they want to see things rolling around they want to see things that look innovative and strong people and it's exciting to see yeah it is i mean the only downside is it's harder for me to get a platform now you know <laughs> Very true. <laughs> i uh, i walk in sometimes i'm like <clears throat> and they just added another one too yeah. at, at my gym and i'm like gosh i gotta wait and then i think about it, i'm like it's pretty cool that I get to wait. Like, I'm going to do my mobilizations. I'm going to stretch, maybe have a chat. Uh, and it's 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 a really cool trend. It's very exciting. I love to see people do strength because I think there's very few things out there um, that build confidence in one's individual self than doing strength training. And obviously, we know the, the long-term health benefits of having, you know, strength and more muscle mass or just being more useful as a person, right, as a human being if you're stronger. So it's, it's a really cool trend. Um, Innovation, man. I mean, you know, from NASM's point of view, obviously, you guys are out there trying to stay ahead of the the trends, the innovations, educating the trainers and the coaches on on what's next, give them the tools they need to to stay up to date. Innovation is happening at such a blistering pace, right? I had um, I sat here and we talked to, to talked to Garrett Marshall yesterday from Exponential on the digital side. And we had a long conversation about artificial intelligence, a long conversation about virtual and um, altered realities, mixed realities, uh, and what that plays. I mean, it's so hard to keep up. It's like I would imagine as soon as you guys put out an educational product, mm -hmm. the next one has already come, mm -hmm. right? If not already passed. So like when you look at innovation and the rate of it. Um, and let's maybe just, because it's it's too big of a topic, so maybe it's narrowed down to the scope, scope of, of health clubs. Like, what innovations are you seeing in the health club space? And maybe if you have any examples of people who you think are doing, uh, when I say people, I mean, you know, businesses or chains or individuals too. But, you know, who, who's doing interesting stuff? So what do you see on the innovation side? Let's start with the apps. Okay. Everybody has an app. And apps started as a, a mode of convenience to where it's a, well, you don't need to bring your membership card in. You just show your QR, QR code and go from there. And I look at what clubs are doing now with the apps, going back on what everybody is seeking, which is that accountability, right? Small percentage of people are like, I don't need my health club to send me a note of, of that I wasn't here that week. I'm good with it. I've made a commitment to exercise. The majority of people want that extra layer of accountability. I wake up at 6 in the morning and I'm like, ugh. I'm going to skip today, or I'm really tired after work. And those tend to snowball and grow. So apps started with a basic function, 
And now folks are going through and tracking those workouts, giving you the ability to see the fact of you got there five days this week. You're getting different types of awards. You're getting different types of incentives. You're getting different types of promotions tied into additional services. More of this AI world where it becomes a Eric, health club knows, Eric, you're coming in at this particular time pretty much every single day. Now starts getting a better idea of the fact of you're gravitating to platforms. Now with our technology being able to look at that and go, okay, well, the people that are gravitating to platforms tend to appeal towards these discounts that we're making in the retail store on supplements. Or it may be a, hey, we're going to run a Olympic lifting club that's going to start meeting at Saturdays at 7 in the morning. Because, you know, Saturdays at, at 6 in the morning, you, still, you see these hardcore people that are going. So different things along those lines, utilizing that technology, starting with the app, to be able to create a more customized experience that's going to give the accountability, it's going to give the community, it's going to give the potential products and services that are going to help you in your journey. That I find very, very interesting. I think from a technology perspective, in terms of something that stands out, I saw the evolution of my zone within Health Cubs, where it started off and it's a, what is this crazy new technology that's going to be providing all of this innovative data, et cetera, et cetera. And it was very basic in terms of what it provided. You started seeing it within Health Cubs. It became a phenomenal Health Cub tool to show people that, hey, the first step is get here. Just get here. Second step is let's get that heart rate going. Let's get involved in movement to where it isn't a somebody swiping in. And you used to see a lot of this. Swipe in, sit around, talk to your friends, sit in the steam room, take a shower, go. I went to the health club today. There was some good to it, but there was very little impact that was being made. With a group like MyZone, they come in, and all of a sudden on every television, there's your initials, there's your score, there's your color coding. All very simple, but it was that extra motivation. And I think a lot of folks looked at it from the perspective of, what is that? Here's what it's providing. Once again, level of accountability. I tried this before, failed. Tried this before, it didn't get to where I needed to be. Tried this before, it worked for about three months, but it didn't get me there. But now when I come in and I go into that group exercise class where I'm just working up on my own and I look up at a television screen and I see my stuff on there, that's giving me that layer. Simple technology, effective, deliverable, that helps stimulate what we're trying to do in Health Cup, which is make a difference, provide a solution, get people to keep on renewing that membership, but all the while looking better, feeling better, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And, you know, if you're going to give a shout out to any particular uh, health club innovators, you know, not uh, not the technology companies specifically, but any of the companies work with, I mean, you know, obviously the top of mind comes is like Equinox, mm -hmm. um, other ones like that. But do, is there anybody doing anything particularly interesting from your purview? All of them are doing interesting things. I'm going to call out my home gym in particular, which is Fitness Formula in Chicago. Gail Landers runs it. Fantastic representative for our industry, very involved with URSA and advocacy, et cetera, et cetera. And he has beautiful facilities that are in Chicago. We started talking about community, and I see what that community looks like, ultimately, in terms of what he tries to stimulate and grow. He has his ear to the ground in terms of how his facilities are built and what is showcased and what is convenient for members. What I really like and, I, and, and what sticks out in my mind is what he's been able to do with the high school aged students. And, and, and I want to bring this out because I do find it to be quite different. I have a senior in high school who lives at the FFC club when he is not involved in his school athletics, his travel ath athletics, et cetera, et cetera. His friends go as well. They've created an environment that is incredibly welcoming to the 14 to 18 year old, not only during the summer, but throughout the year. There are basketball courts that they've set up to where kids can participate without you know, get out of here, the adults are over here. They've created a workout floor where kids are more and more and more comfortable with, with doing workouts within freeway rooms. They've been incredibly welcoming to this population. And in turn, what's happened is that very often, 
the high school student wants to buy a membership. The parents start going over there. And now I've never seen this to the degree that I've seen it now within Gales FFC clubs is that you have parents, and I've gotten to know a lot of these parents. Parents are over there running on the treadmill. One of them is over in the Pilates room. And the kid is back in the freeway room. The entire family is going in, and it isn't just a put the kids back into into uh, into the kids club. It's a everybody is participating in exercise in a variety of different ways. So that community that extends well beyond the typical adult that's going to be paying for a membership now, it's incorporated in this younger population in a real effective fashion. And that's that's critical, it right? Is. I mean, just for for the future of. Uh, I don't want to sound dramatic, but the world, mm -hmm. right? Like we need to get, uh, we need to get the youth involved. I mean, I, I feel so fortunate that I got involved in sports early on. Um, you know, I, I, I was a, I was a chubby kid, man. And if I hadn't got into swimming and then all the sports that I did, water polo and, and all, I wouldn't have had that baseline of fitness, right? So it's such a critical age. It's like right in those, those early teens, um, through high school, like if you don't get those habits built in, then it's really hard to get them later on in life. And I've seen that with so many people I've grown up with. So that's, that's really encouraging. And I hope a lot of people follow that model. I, I would agree. And it, and it's not only the after school or kids bored in the evening. So they're going over there and screwing around in the club. I'm an early morning exerciser. I can't tell you how many times that I've gone over during the school year at six in the morning. And I've seen a kid who's a football player and a lacrosse player. And it's during the off season and he's over there getting 6 a.m. lifts in. Yeah. That didn't exist 10 years yeah, ago. Yeah, that's it, cool. It's, it's the, 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 the culture that's been established. And, and there are probably a number of different factors. But it's a, from a health club perspective, to understand the value of that community, welcoming that community, making it an appealing environment, and the impact that has is significant. Right on. Right on. Well, David, it's it's uh, believe it or not, it's almost been 15 minutes of recording. I mean, these <laughs> things go so fast. It's it's wow, especially now. Uh, you know, I get the opportunity to do it uh, IRL, as the kids say it. Uh, it's it's really cool. I mean, um, it, it, this is always the question I like to ask them. But what, what do you need right now? Like, how can our community help you? Is there anything uh, you know that's that's initiatives that you're driving that you could use help with? I would say this, overall, from an NASM perspective, and this goes for education providers, certifiers, et cetera, et cetera, we live in a world that is very, very similar in terms of our health club environment, so in terms of fitness professionals, et cetera, et cetera, but the standards that are put forth are, are quite unique and different. From a United States population, we still live in a world to where anybody can call themselves a personal trainer. Anybody can call themselves a speed, agility, quickness coach, a, a strength and conditioning coach. There's no licensure. There's no minimum education requirements. And I think it's easy for some folks to look at it and say, okay, well, I look the part. I can kind of talk the part. And I follow a whole bunch of people on Instagram that are doing great workouts that the education certification process is sometimes looked past. Or in some cases, folks look at it from the perspective of, all right, I need to get certified just to get a job. And they get certified, and it's, it's not required, and so it's, it's a, I don't need to maintain it. Other countries are surpassing us when it comes down to that value of education. So my big thing would be get certified, get advanced specialties, continue to learn. It doesn't mean, oh, go buy an NASM product and go get this advanced specialty and this, this uh, credential, et cetera, et cetera. It's a continually be an education seeker within our industry. From 1996, a lot of the research that we, uh, what we knew in 1996 is far different than what we know now. This is not a field to where it's like, we've learned everything, nothing else is gonna be new. Five years from now, we're going to have a different perspective on this. Ten years from now, we're going to have a different perspective on this. Stay atop of the research, the evidence-based education. Stay on top of follow great sources out there. Become a champion of this industry. And that doesn't mean just a, I'm going to get my lifts in and look good in this T-shirt. It's about learning what's going to help people get to their goals safely and effectively. Yeah, I like that. And if I could add like two more things to that, I think it's, you know, stay on top of the education, get the reps in. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people want to avoid like the uh, young trainers may, may be adverse, I should say, not avoid, but to like the health club or the, the typical big box gym where you get in, you do it like 
get the reps, like get to work with a lot of clients and also get a mentor. Like yes. that was critical for me is like mentors help make sense of all the experience, the education pieces and, and the practical application of it all. And of course you get to gain uh, philosophy. And I think that's a lot of things that um, trainer, young trainers have to get on their own is your own coaching, training, philosophy, and approach towards health and fitness. And I know that sounds esoteric, but it's it's really critical. It's like, well, how do you approach it? Because this is very, what we do is, is very, uh, fitness is emotional, right? It's not just programming and numbers and physiology. It's, it's the human being and you have to be able to connect with people in that way. So I think that's something else I would throw on top of that is kind of like the cherry that, you know, goes on top of the, the, the cupcake, right? Uh, as well. I, w I would add one thing to that. It was sure. really well put. Confidence. We talked about member confidence in terms of losing confidence in themselves when they try a variety of different things and they don't get to their goals. Far too often within our industry, you have a passionate, aspiring fitness professional that goes through the certification process, is ready to make a commitment to this industry. Um, in a lot of cases, maybe they went three years to college and they were never passionate about it. And they made this poll. They get started in a traditional health club environment with a boutique, maybe starting their own business. They have a hard time with the confidence and the services that they're delivering. So when it comes down to it is that, hey, I can make a difference in people's lives, but I'm not really comfortable sitting in front of somebody and saying, this is my procession rate. Right? This is the package that I want to get you involved in. The person that tends to be passionate about this industry very often is not the best salesperson. Far too often, this wonderful advocate for our industry starts in and three months later, they go, I'm not good at this. I yeah, can't right. do this. Right. They don't have the confidence. Eric, you and I have been doing this for a long period of time. Nobody goes forth, works with a personal trainer, and comes back later and goes, that was a waste of time. They learn. They have that level of accountability. The people that get the results, the great personal trainers out there, they stand up in people's weddings. They, they, they get referrals. Their whole entire business model is because of they've made a, such a huge difference in people's lives that now they're training their sister, their business partner, and, uh, and, and their cousin who came in from out of town. All of these things, that, that is the heart of this business. And so for all of those folks that are going through the education process and maybe having a hard time giving it a go, find that mentor and talk to them about not only their programming, but how do you sell your services? What is the key here? How do I get more comfortable? Can I role play with you and show you how I present a package to somebody? Have that confidence. Your ability to change people's life is significant. Charging $100 per hour, people would gladly pay that if you can get them to where they've wanted to be for the last 20 or 30 years. Awesome, man. That's that's a, that's a great ending point. And uh, David, if people want to get a hold of you, they want to connect with you, is there any particular place you want to send them online? Absolutely. My email address is probably the easiest way to do that. So it it is david.vandaff, V-A-N, capital D-A-F-F, -F, at nasm.org. Right on. David, thank you so much. Uh, it's been really insightful. It's been fun talking to you here in the middle of all this energy and idea. And uh, I, I love the whole team from NASM. You guys have a, a really great vibe. So safe travels home. Thank you for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, David Van Zandt. Thanks, Eric. It's been great.